I'm here to introduce uh, Stev Svartz. He's here from all the way from Paris. Um, Stev has been a developer for a really long time, and he's held some super cool positions. He's worked with Steve Jobs at Next. Uh, Stev has been one of the first uh, certified Java developers. He's been, he was an advocate for .NET way back in the day, and so when I look at Stev, I really think that he's somebody who has seen the past. He's seen where .NET and Azure and Next and these, all these big companies have been, and, uh, and he's been a developer for so long that he knows where we're going and uh, is always looking towards the future. And so Stev is constantly building amazing chatbots for our team, for customers to use, for people to hack on at hackathons and really figure out and understand the chatbots. And so uh, I think you guys are very lucky to be here today for one of his sessions. Um, afterwards, I would highly recommend checking out his GitHub. I am constantly in, in Stev's repos um, looking for good examples, and he is always creating them. So please welcome uh, Stev. Hello, guys. Yeah. Then. Thank you very much for the introduction, Austin. Uh, you'll see I have a French accent. Um, let me know if you prefer me to speak French. Uh, oh, I have to stay in the light. Um, then I have a challenge is to teach you everything I know about bots in 40 minutes. Um, and I think we can do that. Uh, I've, been, I've been playing around with bots for some time. Then the first part of the conversation will be much more about the basics about bots, but I want that to tell you about what gets difficult when you start building your bots and how you can get above those difficulties. How many of you have already built bots? Okay, a few of them. Okay, very of you. Okay, very good. Then for the new, the beginners one, if you want to follow along, you just create an account on developer.ciscospark.com. And from there, this is a classroom. My goal is ready to put you with, uh, to give you hands on. I will also show you some resources you can go to. But the first part of it, you, you, may, you may make it, uh, even if it's a large classroom. OK, then uh, you know me already. Um, I've been running operations at several companies also, which means that yeah, business is critical. And chatbots, I like them. I love them. Uh, it's a toy. Uh, we can have fun with them. But it can also be something very critical for an, an enterprise. And this is where the, this talk is going to. Um, then um, let's talk about bots, how I started with bots. This is my first bot. <laughs> uh, first bot with Cisco Spark. It was, it was Daisy. It, I named it like that. It was for my kid. She was six years old at that age. And you know, if you're six years, you're just trying to you know how to write your name, but you don't know about spelling, how to interact with the user interface, how to work with the keyboard. Uh, you don't know about spelling. And then I just created that bot that was engaging for my, for my daughter. And she was speaking to that bot, Daisy. And she was asking for, I want to see a dog. I want to see a cute cat. I want to see a cute cat and a cute dog together. And I realized after a few months, she was able to write pretty well because the tool was helping her when she was doing mistakes. She had to go back when she was doing a mistake and to move forward. And it was a very good educational tool. I didn't, yeah, then, and now today she's, she's second grade. Um, two years later, I don't know the name in, US school, but anyway, she's been learning now to write and to do spelling. And she's pretty good at that. And sometimes I'm saying, yeah, well, maybe it's because of Daisy. Then a bot can do that. Oh, it's still on my GitHub if you want to meet Daisy. And then uh, there's someone, uh, I'm in France. I have a good friend called DG. Um, he's, he works at Cisco, he's in Amsterdam. I met him last week, and he does crazy things with bots. And he's also giving a lot of trainings in Europe. And one of these bots is about giving him the camera. It's the entrance where he lives. Then that's one. I think he has connected his dishwasher. And sometimes his wife says, hey, why are we buying this new machine? He says, hey, look at that. It's got an API. Uh, I'm gonna, I will know when it's running around. And then he, he has something for his, for his toilets. How many times he flushes his toilets per day? 
okay? Then just imagine this is the internet of everything. It can be anything. When we do hackathons with Austin, we, we, we've been in Portugal. We had a great hacking company there. They were taking the, all the house was automated and they connected with bots. Okay, then that's, that can be what you do. You can also do something more technical. Then this is an example of a bot that extracts some technical information that's pretty useful for developers that work with Cisco Spark. We may use it during the demos. And another bot I'm using a lot is a Cisco DevNet bot. Uh, then this is what it does here. You just ask the bot what's going on now. Then see it here. Um, I will start a tool called Zoomit. If you don't have Zoomit on your machine, you should install on your Windows machine. You should install it. Look at that. It's pretty handy now. Everybody can see even at the back. Okay, then when you ask the bot what's going on now, you say, hey, DevNet Create is going on. And if you want to continue the conversation with DevNet after this show, uh, you just type next and you'll see what's going on in the next weeks. You have some comments like next 10 and you'll have the next events coming up. Okay. And um, yeah, that's it. Then think of those kind of bots more enterprise related. You go to a back end, you extract some data, and you push them back to the user. Okay. And then this starts the conversation. And now I'm going to explain you what it takes to build those bots from a developer perspective. And then first, you need to choose a platform. And for the purpose of these demonstrations, we will use Cisco Spark, which is Cisco's collaboration platform. It can help you create messages. That's what we will do a lot. But we can also create meetings and calls. And the classroom right after me will show you how to create a video application from scratch, just to integrate video into your existing apps. Okay. And that's the announcement we made in the keynote today. What about the platform we are using? The Cisco Spark platform is exposed through APIs, and we can, you can reuse them and leverage them without installing anything on your backend. You just leverage cloud services. For now, we concentrate on messages. Then first, you, select, you choose a platform. Second part is this platform needs to have an API and so that you can interact programmatically and say, I want to create a room, a space where I can chat. I want to create a message. I want to delete message. This is the important part of it, how you interact with, with the tool. But the other part is webhooks on Cisco Spark. And I'm going to explain now what is a webhook because this is the technology that goes behind and helps implement your bots. Then, when you create a bot, and you saw my bot working earlier, the Cisco DevNet bot, you ask a question, you get an answer. Then it's your code running somewhere, somewhere at your enterprise company or in a public cloud, anywhere. And the user is chatting. Then first thing he does is interacts. The cloud platform gets the messages sent from the person and then pushes it back to an internet, a publicly available endpoint on the internet. For that to happen, you need to create what we call a webhook to register where is your bot listening. Then this is the first part of the job. Second part of the job is when you get those comments coming, you just send them back. Then you post back. Okay. Then now let's get hands on and see how it works. We'll start from scratch. Then for those of you who created the developer, .ciscospark.com account. And the good news, developer.ciscospark.com is a developer program for Cisco Spark. And when you connect and sign in, it's exactly the same credentials than when you run Cisco Spark. Okay. And it means you only create one account. Then if you've registered, you should see your ID there with some information, your private token with which you can connect to an API. But here, what we want, we want to create a bot. For that, we go to My Apps. You just click this area, and you're being brought to a user interface when you can say, I want to create something new. You, you, you click the plus button. I got a lot of bots, OK? It's my, I'm being paid to create bots. I've got hundreds of them. 
Every time I do a conference, I try to create a bot for that. That's that's fun. You'll see. And then, oh, did I click the the wrong button? Then plus. Mm. Is it just released a new version of the portal this morning, coming with the announcement? Okay, let me find the link. I think we can have an add. Okay, then this will be the, the link you'll need to add here. Add bot. Yeah, the page hasn't changed. Okay, then just, just add that, the ex extension. Add dash bot dot HTML, and you'll go to the page. And Austin, thanks for mentioning the developer portal team that we need to fix that. Then you give it a name, and it's gonna be mm, Daisy Only Better. Um, you choose an address, um, maybe Daisy2. Then your bot will be named Daisy2 at sparkbot.io. Yeah, it will be its unique identity. And all thing you need to create now is to have an icon. This icon needs to be five by five hundred twelve by five hundred twelve. Um, the best place to do that is to go to Place Kitten. Place Kitten is an handy tool. You just give him a size, and it gives you a cat of this size. Okay, then five one two by five one two is what I want here. Okay, then I just pick this address. Put that back here, Shoot, and I'm done. It's creating a bot identity. It means a machine identity. It's not a human behind it with its own credentials token. We're going to take this token. It's the way you can interact with the API under the bot identity, as if it was a bot typing the commands there. Did we lose something? Are you still there? Hi, Tim. Oh, did I? Oh, I pushed on a button, maybe. HDMI? Yeah. OK, I'm not supposed to do that. Sorry, guys. Then you pick that here. You've got an access token. You pick it there. You copy it, and you keep it in a safe place, because we're going to use it in the next step. Next step is to find a place where we're going to push our data as events happen in real time in Cisco Spark. You're chatting with your bot. Then let's say you're chatting with your bot. First, you'll connect to Cisco Spark with the same identity. Oh, the address for that is web.ciscospark.com. OK. Is it there? Web.ciscospark.com. On my side, I have installed, installed the, wi the Windows application. Then I'm already logged in. Then in there, you create a new space. And you say, I want to talk to my bot. And you, oh, it's the ID of the bot here. I'm going to put his name. Was it Daisy2? Daisy2. Daisy only better. Here she is. If you can't find her, you say Daisy2 at sparkbot.io, and you find the bot. And the bot is already discoverable by the entire universe. Anybody that knows the address of the bot can talk to it. Now what happens when I say hi? Nothing happens, because there's no code logic. Then I've got a bot, I'm talking to a bot, and I need to register a webhook so that it pushes my message. Let's do that. For that to happen, we're going to push our messages to a, an empty bin that will just receive all the information from Spark. The tool I'm using to do that is called is a free tool. It's called requestb.in. It's very handy. If any, o if any of you is keen on bots or doing interactions on the internet, it's just a place where you can push data flows, JSON payloads, for example, and see them going uh, around. Then here you click Create a Bin. I'm creating a request bin. See it there? I've got an ID, a unique ID. If at any time someone is pushing data there, I will receive the message. Then now we want Spark to push data. Here. How do we do that? We register the webhook. Then let's go back to Cisco Spark for Developer. I go to the API reference documentation. This is where I created my bot. And I will click on, oh, I have to pick my token because I'm going to use that in a few seconds. And then I, I will control click to open a new tab for the webhooks. Among the options here, 
I'm proposed to post. Post in REST means, in REST style, means creation. Then I will create a webhook. I will pick this line. And there, I've got an interactive interface that lets me place some REST calls towards the Spark cloud. Then I want to create a post request to this endpoint, v1 slash webhooks from Cisco Spark. I will place, press this button here, test mode, so that everything goes interactive now. Can you see the difference? Here it was documentation. Now it's live, interactive documentation. Then I can go there and say, hey, this token here, is the token, is my token, personal? Now I want to do actions to create the webhook under the bot identity. Then I will remove, I will keep the B report, and I will paste my bot account token. And now I'm creating a webhook under the identity of my bot. I keep Biro in the space. And then I give it a name. It's, uh, for sure, it's a devnet. Create first webhook whenever you like so that you can remember it. And the most important part is the target URL. Where are we going to push those messages? And guess what? We'll go to request bin. Then I'm picking it again. I go back there, and I paste my target URL. And now I'm pushing my message to this place. What am I pushing? Um, I'm going to push everything. Mm, everything is all, I think, and all events. And now everything that happens, or maybe only messages created, then it's either you want all events to be pushed to your webhook on only one type of events. You can show that. The documentation is pretty um, detailed. You can put a secret if you want to generate a NASH code for your JSON payload, if you want a NASH Mac signature, so that you can be sure that it comes from Cisco Spark when you get post a JSON payload. And you run it. Then now it's a 200 means success. I've just created a webhook. Then if I come back to my endpoint and I want to show what's going on, it says, hey, nothing's going on for now. Of course, I haven't pushed any message to my bot. If I go back to that room and I say, hello again. Nice to be here today. Oh. It's a bit cold, though. Okay, I have to say it's a bit cold. OK, then now let's refresh my page. I go back to request bin. I refresh my page. And what does I get? Oh, I get data. Look at that, HTTP data and my JSON payload here. What does it say? Mm, it's JSON. And the best way to see JSON is to have an editor or to go to an online editor. Then I will pick this editor. I will paste my the payload I just got. And I will refresh it, and I say, yeah. You just received from this webhook a message has been created and by this person, if I checked, it would be me, Steve Swartz. And here is the data associated with it. And you find some extra data okay, about the message that has just been sent to you. Then we just you've just understood that when you create a bot, it's about as easy as that, you create a bot identity, you register it on your messenger platform, and then the message flow to your bot. This is a connect thing. Next part, so next part of it. Let's see now what's come to your bot journey. Uh, first thing is generally in, in an enterprise, you'll be behind a DMZ. Okay, you won't be your bot won't be internet facing if you want to go to enterprise data. Okay, then the same principle that applied in the past, this address was an HTTP address, they will still apply, it will be exactly the same. Okay. Then you just connect them, you go to your IT shop, and you explain them, this is how, what I want to connect to. Next part is, where well, yeah, when I'm, I'm running my bots on my laptop, I need to code my bots, I need to test them in real time, and I 
don't want to deploy them every time I'm coding my bot. Then what I need to do is I need to use a tool that connects my laptop to the internet so that my laptop get exposed on the internet and the Cisco Spark platform can post to my bot. How does I do that? I use a tunneling technology. Then I spoke about request bin before, which is an ND tool. The second ND tool is ngwok or local tunnel. I tend to, st I started with local tunnel. I tend to like ngwok very much now. And it's your choice. All those tools are free. And you create what you do when you start a tunnel. It's just one line of code. You will just do um, ngrok HTTP port 8080. And when you do that, instantly, um, or not instantly, when I get back my command line. OK. Now I have an endpoint that has been created here. Can you see this address? It's an, it's an HTTP address redirecting on the internet, redirecting to my local machine. Then instead of connecting to request bin, you just connect to that address, goes to my local machine, and connects to my code. Very handy tool for bot developers. 99% uh, of those bot developers work that way. Then next part is how do we code the bot logic? I receive an event, and I have to do some processing and post back to the platform the answer from the bot. Okay. Well, it's either you write all that code, it's some kind of an API, it receives you post events to your bot code, then you have to take that JSON data, go into that data, check which kind of event has happened, and then create a connection to the cloud and push messages, then you can write all that code yourself, and we've got a lot of examples. But if you've got a good bot framework, it can be two lines of code. It can be as simple as bot, you create a bot instance, and then you got a bot on command, hello, and you receive the command that has been, when, it's, when the event hello gets fired in a room, you receive a command is instantiated, Oh, sorry, and then you pick, you can do something with your command, you get the message in there, and who has posted it, and this bot just answers hello, the person that has sent the message. Then hello, 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 hello. Okay, you can say hi, you can translate it, then you can call the next standard API, and you can start doing your job of a developer. Then this, this command is pretty, uh, we've created at DevNet a small bot framework called Not Sparkbot. It's very handy to take your first steps and to learn about that technology. And we've got a learning lab backstage where you can learn how to do this step by step. Um, but the community has been at work. And we've got two bot frameworks in the Cisco Spark communities that are very active in Node.js. It's Flint and BotKit. And uh, uh, the code will look very similar. You will always have some kind of a code that says, I want to hear for comments. And when they happen, you do something. Then it's two lines of code again. You hear for a command, and it replies. Everything is encapsulated in this bot framework. As a difference, whatever the platform is, I'm, or I'm talking a lot about Cisco Spark here today, but the same principles apply to all chat platforms. Then. In all communities, you will find different frameworks because developers, they, we love creating our own frameworks, and they're always better, and there's always something we don't like, and we create a new one. Then here, uh, we try to highlight what's important, and in our opinion, what's important here is about Flint is very focused on Cisco Spark. It's Cisco Spark only. It goes deep on Cisco Spark. It does a lot of things behind the scene, like some kind of retries, what happens if I send a message back, but the platform is not listening, and then you want to retry automatically? This is something that Flint and Node Sparky does automatically for you. And yeah, this is pretty handy. On the other side, we've got BotKit. BotKit is the number one community framework. It's got 6,500 6, stars on the GitHub. Uh, it's one of the 10th coolest projects on GitHub, one of the most 
well known. When I say tense, tense, uh, not among the big ones. Okay, we've got Apache and a lot of big actors. But if you go to the smaller projects, it's, it's one of the 10 biggest ones and, and the most active recently. Um, then it's, it's great because it covers several bot platforms. You can use the same kit to interact with, I don't know, whatever your platform is. Uh, Messenger, for example, then you can use the same platform to send your message and, uh, and create a, an interoperable bot. You can change chatting platform. Um, it, got, it has got a key value data store to store context, and that's what I'm going to talk about now because it's more advanced concepts, and also conversations. And this drives us to the next conversation, which is I know how you know how to build a bot. You use a bot framework, you create a webhook, but what happens next? And we've got 15 minutes left to discuss that. Okay, then. First thing is you want your bot to be pretty nice with people. Then when you're here for the conference, we've created a bot. It's called the DevNet Create Bot. Then you create a space called DevNet Create Classroom, and you'll just Invite the bot there, DevNet create, let's join the room. Kay. And other people, let's, let's invite Austin. Watch. Then I just created a room with those bots, and guess what? The bot is already talking to me. Then this is uh, what you want, OK? You want to know how you're going to interact with that bot. Um, at DevNet, we've been working with the Cisco Spark team, and we've been um, analyzing the submission we have for bots so that they, get, they can get registered and referenced at a marketplace that is called the depot, Cisco Spark depot, where you can find about bots. And what we saw is that we had to refuse some bot submissions just because the bot one didn't have a good user um, experience. And the first part is first you want a bot to welcome your users so that you know what you can do with that bot. Then here, see here, you say, hey, hey, I'm the DevNet Create Bot Conference. This is what you can do with me. Okay. That, that's great. How do you create that? Well, in fact, it's one line of code with BotKit. You just add that controller. You've got that controller on BotKit framework, and you say on, and you reply when you've got a message. And I'm the DevNet Create Bot. Okay. Every, all, all that code is online. You will just connect to GitHub, Cisco DevNet, and DevNet Create Bot. And you'll have the all samples. You know how to host it. You know how to run it by yourself. Okay, But it's two lines of code, and you've got your bot saying hello when he joins the room. And you all time. Next part is you want to make it simple for your users. What if someone forgets what you, your bot is about? You just help add an help command. When someone starts help, you give him some help. Next part, what if someone says something? Not correct. Let's say, for example, here I type, hey, I type, help me. Okay, this is something the bot doesn't understand. For example, what should happen there? In your opinion? Oh, first thing is here, I'm not mentioning the bot. Then here I will have to mention him. At DevNet Create, help me. This is some security feature we have in Cisco Spark that requires you to, when you talk to a bot, you need to mention him so that the bot can't capture everything that happens in a room. Because otherwise, it would take all your information and would be able to read them. Then as it's not a human, it's just supposed to take the messages when he's, men when he's mentioned. This is what I just did here by adding his name. Then it says, hey, help me. It says, help me. And it says, oh, I help you. What if someone now says, um, at DevNet Create, Toto, which is a French word which means foo, yeah. and says, hey, sorry, I didn't understand it. Try something else. And then, yeah, and then you want your bot to be pretty handy. Then you say, hey, DevNet Create, what the, the job o of your bot, its real behavior, is to tell you what's going on now. And now it's the mini hacks are running. It's apps mid deploy in Seattle, right there. And here we are running a classroom. Okay. Then this is the real behavior of your bot going on. Then don't forget the fallback command. I see a lot of bots that, that don't have a fallback command, and you're just trying to interact and to talk to the bot, and you don't know how to do it. 
Uh, again, it's one line of code uh, with BotKit. You just add at the end of your code. Uh, if I hear anything, you have add hello, hi, help, now, current, all the words you want, and the last one is anything else. And when if anything else is pressed, you just say, okay, you need help, guy, because you did not make it. Next part. The next subject is what most developers contact us for at DevNet is say, okay, that's nice, but I want to have richer conversation. And for that, a lot of people have heard about NLP, and they say, okay, now I will have to go to another platform to create something more sophisticated. I have to say it's not the case. There's a lot of situations you can handle with your own local code and bot kits. I will show you what. And then, what are user context? User context is this ability to say, hey, DevNet Create, show me the next maybe three events, next whatever you want. And here now I get the next activities, and it's got a number there. Which means that after that I can type another command with a number, and my code will remember that that number references something I said earlier. This is pretty complicated to build because you need to have uh, some context, it's asynchronous, and it's related to each, to each person using the bot, okay? The number three for you will be different for Austin and from all the, any other people here because you have loaded different data. And that is something that BotKit does by default. It's just embedded in the tool. You can store data that has been gotten and store it in a user context so that you can reuse it later. And this is an awesome work job here. Second part is, what if your user just says about? Then now let's do it. It's going to be more fun. Then I ask DevNet Create, give me a b tell me about the next 100 activities. Okay. Then now I've got everything that's coming on till, till tomorrow. Then I want to know more about what we're doing. Uh, maybe, oh, there's a chatbot. Okay, we, uh, we'll have a session right after. Okay. About four, that's going to be a cool thing, I'm pretty sure. About, but what, what if I don't say four? I say about. When my bot, does, it's like a pizza, you don't know which pizza you want. You want to engage a conversation, a sub-conversation inside and say, hey, what do you want to talk about? Then my bot just answered, hey, this is everything I had. It gives me my, my data back. Which activity are you inquiring about? What do you want? And then you say, hey, just answer the number. I don't have to say about anymore. I'm in this context of choosing an event. Then I just say, at DevNet Create, give me information about number four. And I'm good. Then sit there in those few lines of code. And you could just create a conversation, store information, enter subcontext, and you I didn't use any third-party tool that does NLP and guess my in information. Then this is what you can build today. Now I'm going to talk about what you can't find yet on the internet, what doesn't exist, and what propositions we can do, and how we're going to build the future of bots. Then next question is, who created that bot? What is the usage policy? Is it free? Is it paying? Does it need a license? Um, how can I contact support, send feedback? And what about that, the, the data? When I use code, I have a data. When I use something, I have creative commons so that I know the license that goes with the document. I know also the policy of websites, uh, the policy of when they use cookies to store my sessions. How is that bot is going to use my data? And this is a strong concern for anybody. Then what I proposed here, I just added something very small to my bot. I said, hey, when someone says ping, you will just answer him some information about you. And says, hey, this is DevNet who created this bot. If you need support, you just call Steve. St and then you can say, I've been, it's been up since that time. There's a version. And if you want the code, you can just go there. Okay, it's just meta information. But there's no standard for that. That you will, have you will have to add it, and some the people will have to know it. What about you? we create a standard? And if we create a standard, what if it was exposed by the bot itself? Then now what I created, I say, okay, maybe someone 
wants to create an engine that goes and interacts with bots, then what if my devnet create bot, which is hosted on Aeroq, okay, where is that address? Mm, devnet create bot Aeroq app, okay. Devnet create, and it's a bot, it's not the API, bot. And now I can ping him. It's a bot, it answers to post events when I've got webhooks notifications, and now I just added a get event, and uh, I get the data. Isn't it nice? You don't have any tool anymore, you just get that data. What can I do with that? It's like a health check when you do operations. You need to enter that your program is running correctly. Then the next part is a lot of sometimes your bot is down. Just it doesn't answer. And I have a problem now. How can I ask my bot if he's alive or not? <laughs> then what if? And we have a lot of those conversations at, at Cisco saying, hey, who's created that bot? You're trying to find the person and all that. And the proposal is we're going to create a universal database in which we're going to reference the bots, but we won't tell about what the bot does. We will just put the metadata, just that info about that bot. Where is the health check? And then you will just ask the metadata bot, hey, is it running? Is it live? What are the licenses? It's all those metadata, okay? And to discuss that, we've got a session in 10 minutes from now, right there. And if you have been working around bots, I will be happy to dig into those ideas and what we're thinking putting in there. And I would lo love to have a community start this project and we, start, we decided to go for DevNet Create to start that, con that conversation. Next part is hosting. Hosting a bot, yeah. Hosting, at the end of the day, a bot is nothing more than an API. It receives post commands, get commands, then if you know how to create a website to protect it, it's HTTP. An API has got some ex extra best practices. When you create an API, you have to take care about authentication, rate limitation, caching, doing some logging, transformations. You can do that either inside your code by yourself, or by taking framework and embedding them in your code, or you can choose to use a reverse proxy Okay, some kind of HR proxy or Nginx. You add some plugins in there, and we've got the Kong technology. It's open source. That's it's all a bunch of plugins that come with, with Nginx, for Nginx for you. Another option would be to take maybe Caddy server. It's written in Go. I use it a lot, and you'll have some plugins you can add. Then you create the bot the same way I did today. You just add a reverse proxy in front of it, and the reverse proxy will take care of security, rate limitation, and everything you want to protect your bot. That's what I suggest. Don't change the code of your bot to add even SSL. You want a, a remote proxy to do that for you, or yeah, just your web server. You don't want to add that into your bot. Then hosting. Um, the next part of it is how am I going to host that bot? There's a lot of options. It's a piece of code. It's like web. Uh, you can go. The main discussion I have usually is who's going to pay for the bot? <laughs> Remember when we created those first mobile applications? It was mobile applications were just a toy. We had no money for it. You just say, hey, look at that. I've got a mobile. I can put some application there. And over time, marketing team said, hey, we want a mobile app. And they could invest hundreds of thousands of euros, of dollars for you people. Uh, OK? Then think of it. We are in the same ages now. It's the beginning of bots, and nobody wants to pay for them, but they are very useful, as I showed you. Okay, DevNet create, how can I know what's going on? You just have to ask the bot, but who's going to pay for that? Then you need to find the best price for the hosting aspects. What I suggest is you go with, first, you want to go with free plans. I like to use AeroQ free dinos. It's your bots are just there, hanging. They take 30 seconds to respond so that they wake up, and then they are up for 30 minutes and then they sleep again. Okay. It's very handy for a bot that you don't want anybody to pay for. They just have to wait a bit. There's another option. I've been tested recently. It's serverless functions. If you've heard of AWS Lambda or Google function, Azure functions, what are they? Those are 
cloud platforms that help you run code, basic code, and they give you credits, a lot of credits, millions of invocations for free, two million for Google Functions which is pretty good because after that, for the next million, you get to pay 40 cents. I can pay 40 cents when I have more than 2 million calls on my bot, okay? And I will have a whole team taking care of hosting my bot and scaling it. How does that work? It's pretty, pretty easy. At the end of the day, a function is nothing else than an entry point. You call it, it takes a request and answers a response. If anybody has does HTTP, request response. You just encapsulate your code, and you say, hey, when I receive a post, I just go to botkit. When I receive a get, I go to my elf check, and then I just export that, and you're done. And now you're running your code. To deploy it, you will say, hey, I want to, from the command line, you want to say, hey, give me not too much memory. Okay, it's just a bot, I don't need a lot. You can have more if you need, and you want to add a timeout because by default, those one million invocations, they have to last 100 milliseconds maximum. If it lasts one second, you will eat 10 credits of your one or two million. Okay, then just make it short here. Imagine I'm going to an API that takes a minute to respond. It would eat a lot. It would eat a lot of my credits. Okay, then just always put a timeout, a small timeout there for your Lambda or Google Functions. Oh, and to finish it, I wanted to wrap it up with how can you build your bot and go to the next stage and pick the right bot framework, add your fallback commands, conversations, test is really challenging. Okay, then there are some testing frameworks that are coming. Choose the best hosting approach, challenge itself, challenge you or even host it internally, it's the same technology, but Nobody's ready to pay for that. And monitor your bot activity. Um, there are some bot frameworks and that do that. Um, bot analytics, uh, there are some others, just look for that. Uh, Google also just recently uh, proposed a Google Analytics extension that works for bots. Um, and for the last part is the natural language processing. Then I showed you how to create a conversation how to store user context. And it means that we can go pretty far when we interact with a user building that. Then what I suggest is you don't turn to NLP right away. NLP is guessing what the user means. The user wants a pizza, the user wants the food, and I can get that, or he wants to, yeah, I'm pretty good at that, okay? Sorry again. And then, I think it's really relevant, those NLP tools, when you are in a B2C scenario, when you're, when you're using something that talks to a real customer, like call centers. Because you've got someone joining a conversation and he just wants to start, you, you're starting the conversation, you don't know what he wants to do. But if you think of it, when you've got some enterprise business tools, the people are joining Salesforce, for example, because they know they want to know more about their deals they're working on. And we are enterprise people here. Maybe it's part of your code or your B2C. Then if you're B2B and it's internal tooling, you certainly don't need an NLP tool. And if you need one, just go to reza.ai. We mentioned it earlier, I think, uh, in another talk. It's a free way to do some NLP if you want to host it at your company. Otherwise, use one of those NLP tools or great, uh, a lot of them. Just make sure that it, it introduces an extra third-party service that can fail, and it lowers your total SLA, okay, because it's an extra step. Um, then, if you want to know more and practice with those bots, we've got a room just behind. You can learn. It's in 15 minutes, you will have your own bot running, and you bring your laptop, and we are here to help. And thank you very much, guys. I'm taking your questions. Right after this call, there's a talk, there's a classroom you about video SDK uh, by Jonathan. Jonathan, do you want to come and start installing there? It's awesome. This is the, Jonathan will tell us about the technology we introduced this morning. And I think that Austin can. Oh, Steph, we've got a question for you over here. Okay. Yeah. Um, with other uh, speech technologies, there are standards for grammars. 
Are th have there been any standards for uh, in the bot world for grammars? You're talking about Grails? Grammar. Grammar. Yeah, okay. like uh, GRXML, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Have there been any uh, movements on standards for the way to describe, you know, uh, what you're looking to listen for, for for a bot? Yeah. How can you build that? It were, are there any standards out there? Sorry, I didn't get it. Yeah. Uh, standards for, uh, I think you're, you're sort oh. of touching on the language, natural language processing yeah, exactly. aspects of it. Okay. Um, the platforms, NLP platforms, uh, usually works with uh, the same concepts. What they do is uh, basically you describe some intents, what two people can do, the concepts, the terminology, you assemble them. Um, I'm not sure they have created any standardized way to do it. Um, they expose the APIs so that you can, you, can, you can work with those tooling. But for the Raza tool set, for example, it's a, an open source tool that can do those grammar processing and intent and, and they are cl cross-platform. And they made some connectors so that they could connect to API.ai from Google um, from, for to Facebook platform and to the different, different NLP services. Then, uh, but I haven't seen a standardized API to do that exactly. We have some for voice, how to define, you know, voice, voice ML, and we have standardized way to, to do that. I haven't seen it for both. I would be interested to, to continue the discussion and, uh, in, the, uh, what is Thanks. It? in the board where we, yeah, we can take bots to the next level. Any other questions? Right. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Well, that should give you guys a, a huge head start. If you had not created a bot before, before now, I definitely suggest talking with Steph while you're here. Um, he's an amazing resource. He's a great teacher. And uh, he has seen a lot of the pitfalls, a lot of the problems. Um, you know, you're asking about standardization for the NLP. I know that internally we've built so many bots that we just decided that it was uh, best for us to provide our own best case, uh, best practices for, for bot building. So we do have a list of uh, what we feel are the, you know, core elements, things, do's and do nots for building your own bots. And uh, Stev will be happy to share that with you. You can c come and find me as well. So, all right. Looks like Jonathan's getting set up here. I get to introduce all our speakers from overseas. So Jonathan's come all the way from the UK. And it's actually, I was talking with him about uh, his talk a few minutes before Stev's, and he's going to build everything live for you guys. So I appreciate him taking that risk. Um, and it says something about him as an individual that he would rather come up here and do that live and take the risk and get all the glory than show you guys some prepackaged uh, slides. So um, hold on tight. <laughs> I know he's got a USB-C laptop too. Um, so he's got a, all the new fancy stuff, fancy connectors. Takes a little longer to plug in here. So I realized when I introduced Stev that I forgot to introduce myself, not like I'm really important, but uh, since we seem to have a few minutes here, I'm Austin Highland. I'm a developer evangelist for Cisco. I work in a collaboration groups, so I work a lot with Spark and Tropo. I just recently joined our IoT team. We'll be doing a lot with those guys. Um, if you guys see me around, please come ask me some questions. I can help you build bots, use the Spark API, do anything with the phone, uh, SMS, uh, if you need to send a text message or build an IVR. Uh, we can help you with that. And actually, Stev is really good at building IVRs. If you know, press one for this, press two for that. Um, on his Objects Advantage GitHub, he has a really, really good sample code for building an IVR that is also uh, a scheduler for a conference. And so if you guys are decide to dig through his repo, I would highly recommend looking at that code as well. So all right, I think Jonathan's ready here. Uh, he, Jonathan Fields, a business manager, or business development manager um, from the UK. 
And like I said, he's going to build everything live here for you guys. And I think there's a prize for anybody that can pronounce the university he went to. So I'll leave you to talk with him. Good. Thank you. Can you hear me? Everything good? I can hear myself, so that's good. Uh, thank, thanks, Austin. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Field. Uh, I'm in the business development team at Cisco. Um, what that word, what business development means, I'm still not 100% sure, but it's a mixture of like doing pre-sales, technical stuff, coding, talking to customers, talking to product, a whole bunch of different fun and interesting stuff. Um, I, I work in the, in the Cisco Spark team, so some of you that have been around Cisco for a while will be familiar with what Spark is. If not, we'll touch on it briefly a bit later. Um, I'm based in London in the UK. I just flew out yesterday. Um, I've been doing iOS development in a number of different forms for about five or six years now. Um, I have worked professionally, I've done some freelancing, uh, but right now I'm almost more of a hobbyist. Um, I still do some professional stuff, but mainly building demos and talking to people about our platform. Um, I play flight sim in my, fl in my free time, so I have a joystick and that's pretty cool. And I have done some work once while doing a long flight, so I always find it's a good way to, uh, to relax. Um, if anybody can pronounce the name of this word at the bottom here, so if anybody can pronounce that, I will buy you a beer later. Uh, but the pronunciation is Aberystwyth. Uh, it's a place in Wales, but I don't know if anybody will have heard of that, but that's where I went to university um, a while back now. Uh, so what I really wanted to spend a bit of time talking about today is um, one of the products that we announced this morning called the Cisco Spark Video SDK. Um, so this is basically taking the media capabilities that we have through Cisco Spark and being able to take just the media stack out so that you can embed voice and video into your own mobile applications and, uh, and websites. So, to do that, I think really there's three main things I wanted to cover. Um, just have a little short discussion around like why do we actually care about video communications? Why is it important in this day and age? Are people actually using it? Um, and then talk through how that will work using the Cisco Spark platform as a base um, and how you would actually go about implementing. And then, fingers crossed, we're going to do some real live code. So I've put together a, a sample application and we're going to go through the process if you were building something yourself how would you go about embedding Spark video capabilities into the app? So um, that's going to get a little bit more hands-on. Should be quite interesting. Um, I have tried it before, and it did work, but it's going to be very live. So hopefully that one's going to work, but we will see. Uh, so when I was putting this presentation together, I was just looking around, and you know, because I use video day in, day out at Cisco. We have video phones. We have video conferencing units. We have video everywhere. It's always on. And it was a little bit weird at the start, but actually you really get to like it after a while. Um, and I was reading about when WhatsApp added voice and video calling capabilities into their app. Um, the video piece actually only came quite recently, uh, but there was an article on Mashable, which you can see at the bottom there, and, and they were saying that just in the few short months that they've been doing video, they have 340 million minutes of video per day going through the WhatsApp video platform. That's like a crazy amount of, of usage, right? Um, I did try to work out what that was in like minutes or years, and uh, somebody can do the maths, but it's, it's an awful lot of video. And people really like the experience, right? I think most people would agree here that, that video is a much better experience than voice. Um, it's, it's kind of difficult to describe why. I mean, you're probably going to say because you can see someone. If you can see someone, the communication experience is better. And actually, it's largely true. Uh, there's a couple of people that have done studies on this. Um, this is a study here. And, there's you know, three different categories in which he, he likes to talk about communication, particularly non-auditory communication, so being able to see someone. Um, and the percentages of like, what actually makes up effective communication is probably a little bit different to what a lot of us are expecting. Like, I might have thought it was the other way around, but you know, if you look at verbal linking, so the, the, the circle on the right, um, that is actually the words that you are saying. Arguably, this guy that, I mean, I'm sure he was a lot smarter than me, he reckons that 7% of communication is actually achieved through the words themselves. Obviously, if you're reading an email, it's very different. But through spoken communication, up to 7% is actually uh, what's being effective there. Um, the tone is very, very important. Um, you can get that through voice. Obviously, you don't have to do that through video. If I speak very, very loudly or very quickly or very slowly or quietly, you, know, you can infer different things about my mood. Um, but the most important piece in the communication spectrum is body language, being able to see the person. Um, I could be telling you something completely different to what it looks like I'm telling you if you, if you look at my face. So you know, it's, there are 
very substantial reasons why being able to see someone will give you a better communications experience. And this is really why we've seen the explosion of video, because it is a better experience. For anybody that uses like meetings apps or calling apps, just try putting your hand over the screen. Like, so if I have a WebEx call, put your hand over the screen where the person is talking and just listen. And immediately, it's much, much more complicated to understand what they're talking about. It's just much better when you can see people. Um, and this is, this is great. And it's like, well, yeah, I'm going to build an app. Uh, I'm building something that's going to have an emotive element. You know, maybe I'm dealing with customers. I'm doing some type of business to customer app. And I want to add the ability for people to call me. Um, anything that's emotive, so high value purchases, anything to do with health, all of these different use cases, there is a very compelling reason to use video as part of that stack. Because when it becomes emotive, getting that additional 55% of the communication spectrum that you get through physically seeing the person is really important. Okay? Um, just out of curiosity, how many people have heard of Spark? Most people in the room? OK, okay, that's a lot better than I thought. OK, that's cool. <laughs> um, so I, I work on the Spark team. Um, and I'm really just going to talk about now a little bit around like how Spark works for those of you that aren't familiar with it. But um, you can install Spark onto your iPhone, your iPad, Android devices, onto your laptop, uh, and also use it through a web browser. So this is a couple of different ways. Go to ciscospark.com, sign up for a free account, log in. You can send messages. You can send and receive calls, do multi-party calls, all of that. Um, so it's very simple for you to consume video calling through Spark today. You just download the app. It's going to work. Um, and what the video SDK is designed to do is allow you to take the media stack and those video calling capabilities, but use them without having to use the Spark client. Okay? So you're still going to be using your Spark account for authentication, but you're going to be able to do it through a device, a mobile app, or a website of your choosing. Okay? Um, another question. Uh, how many people in this audience would say that they are sort of familiar with what unified communications is from a Cisco standpoint? OK. Quite, OK, about a third. That's probably more than I expected, actually. Um, <laughs> so if you want to embed voice and video into your apps, you need to understand just a little bit about how you would do that. Um, we call this a call flow. So if I want to call, I'm signed in on this phone, and I want to call this phone, what do I need to do? Okay. So like I said before, right, everything with Spark really evolves around the account. So I have an account for this phone, and I have an account for this phone. So in this case, abc at xyz.com uh, and xyz at abc.com. Okay? Both are signed in on Spark. Maybe one's on the web and one's on the SDK. Okay? From a developer's standpoint, you don't need to worry about anything. You just need to be able to tell the Spark cloud where you want to call. And that could be an email address of a Spark account. That could be a standards-based video system. It could be whatever you want, right? Um, so abc at xyz.com. Hey, Spark, I want to call xyz at abc.com. Okay? The Spark cloud is going to hear that. Spark knows how to talk to xyz at abc.com. And it's going to take care of all of the signaling, all of the negotiation, everything that you would traditionally need to worry about if you were building a system like this yourself. It's going to take care of for you. So all you need to know is the address of the third party or the remote endpoint that you want to call. Okay? So from a developer's standpoint, very, very easy. The Spark Cloud is then going to pass on a message to that third party or to that whoever the recipient is. And it's going to say, hey, xyz at abc.com, blah, 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 is calling you. Okay? That's all you need to know from a developer's standpoint. The Spark Cloud is going to take care of everything for you. It's going to notify the third party. It's going to tell you that it's ringing, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, if you think about like the topology that we have here, right, it's not a direct connection between the two devices, and there's actually a very good reason for that. Um, we would call this like a centralized um, calling topology. The primary reason for this is there's two things which are very, very important, particularly with mobile devices. So the CPU and CPU usage, how much of my iPhone's resources is it going to take for me to display those video streams, and also the amount of bandwidth that it's going to use. Um, if you talk about like peer-to-peer -peer voice and video in like a normal use case. You've got a direct channel between maybe there's three people that are having a call. If you have a peer-to-peer -peer call, the media needs to be exchanged between each one of those. So I'm having a call with you. I need to send you my voice and video, and you need to send me your voice and video. And it expands, it, it expands out exponentially, right? Um, 
Your local device, in some cases, is even going to have to mix all of those streams together and display them locally. That uses CPU. Um, if you're going to be having a call with a lot of people, you might be retrieving eight or 10 different streams from 10 different people. It's going to be using a lot of bandwidth. So the benefit of using um, basically a centralized topology is that with one stream, because everything's being spoken to the Spark Cloud, it doesn't matter how many different participants there are. Everything comes back as one pre-rendered stream. Um, so if you look at like the, the bandwidth in the CPU, um, it's not a significant amount more for you to have a call with five people than it would be to have a call with one person, right? There's, there's pros and cons of using peer-to-peer -peer versus centralized, but this is part of the reason why we've gone this way, is that particularly for the larger uh, capacity calls, um, it's just a much more efficient, much more efficient um, process from a CPU and bandwidth perspective. Um, if you look at like how that would scale, right? The idea is that the clients don't need to talk to each other directly. Uh, so if you're having a call with four people, or you're having a call with however many people, um, you've just got that one stream going back to you from the Spark Cloud. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, I'm interested in using voice and video capabilities inside of my app. How do I actually go about using it? Um, one thing I was, when I came to write you know, my first app that used the video SDK, uh, it got me thinking. It's like, well, first impressions count. Uh, when you meet someone for the first time, that's a very important first couple of minutes that you have with that person. Uh, and actually, when you think about like, software libraries and SDKs, and I want to choose this vendor versus this vendor, the experience that you have the first time you use the software is really, really important. And it goes the same for SDKs. Um, for those of you that have developed on iOS before, uh, there's a website called Coco Controls, which lists a load of third-party SDKs and libraries and helper files. Um, and I spend a lot of time on there just scrolling through. And it's like, well, this one looks like it meets my needs. Uh, but I download it, and then I try and run it. And it's like, well, it's not compiling, or there's some dependency missing. Um, and really, what, what we've tried to do with Spark is, is make that as, as painless as possible. Uh, but there are always ways to make things less painful. Um, if, we, if we look at like, the vast majority of SDKs and libraries that are out there today, they all have a lot of uh, what we would refer to as boilerplate code. Okay? Um, and what I mean by that is, if you take a video SDK, there's always going to be a certain amount of code that is applicable to everybody that's using that library. So where do I display the participant's video, uh, the remote participant's video, my local video, you know, what happens when a mute button is pressed? All of that is actually, in most cases, shareable between different projects. So if you can take you know, a reference implementation of basic drop-in video components and render that into what we call a wrapper library, which is one of the projects that I'm working on right now and I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute, you can make it very, very simple to embed video into your project. Um, and what I really mean by that is, from a developer's standpoint, again, you don't need to know anything about how unified communications works, how the video gets processed, any of that. All you need to be worried about is, I need to be able to authenticate. So I need to be able to tell Spark that uh, I am a specific user. I'm going to do that either via an API key or some type of OAuth flow. Right? So I need to be able to tell Spark, this is the user that's going to be making the call. Okay? I need to be able to specify a recipient. So in the call flow that I showed just a minute ago, where it was abc at xyz.com as the authenticator. So he's the, like, the, the source or the origin. He's the person that's going to be making the call. I've authenticated as him. The recipient is the guy at the other end, right? So uh, xyz at abc.com, okay? That's the recipient. And then I need to be able to display the view somewhere. So if I have an iPhone app, I need to be able to choose whereabouts in my iPhone app I'm going to display that video. Um, if I'm using something with a navigation controller, you know, I may want to display it when somebody presses the start call button. Uh, again, it's up to interpretation, but everything else apart from that can pretty much be inferred because you're probably, if you're going to be having full screen video, most people's implementations are going to be a full screen video for the remote person, a small video window at the top for the local self view that's going to be from your local device camera, and then you're going to have some buttons rendered in the middle, right? But all of that can be abstracted away. Um, and the example that we're going to show in a minute is exactly that. So authentication, choosing a recipient, and where do you display the video? Um, this is really what the, the wrapper that I've built is designed to do. Uh, this is the actual three lines of code that you would need to embed video into your own app. The first one, right, you're going to instantiate 
uh, an instance of the wrapper. So in this case, the wrapper is called the Spark Media SDK. Um, takes a couple of parameters, takes an API key. You know, it could take something from an OAuth flow, as you wish. All you're doing here is telling Spark, this is who I am, and this is the profile I want you to use when I make a call. Okay? That's one line. Second line, who's the recipient? Okay? What's the type of call I want to make? In this example, you can see it says Spark Media dot video call, and then recipient ABC XYZ dot com. Okay? Um, you could use audio call as well. There's obviously voice and video functionality. Spark Media dot video call, and then the recipient Spark Media dot audio call, and then the recipient if you want to do an audio call. And then the final one, um, there is a command here that's self dot present. What that means is my whatever view I'm in inside of my iPhone app push a new screen up, which is going to be the video window. Okay? You don't need to worry too much about that. It's just standard iOS code. Um, but that is literally all that you would need. Um, there are some different functions that you would handle to see, like, did the call have an error? Uh, has the call ended? Those different types of things. But um, I'll show you that in a second. But it really doesn't need to be complicated to add video into your applications. Um, and hopefully that gives you a, a quick example of what we're going to show in a minute. Um, but let me just go through a couple more things first. Um, so when we were talking about the boilerplate code, the repeatable instances in everybody's projects that can be abstracted away into a wrapper, um, there's a couple of things that most people will use. Again, it's like the 80-20 rule, right? Um, if you think about what you have when you have a FaceTime call today, when the FaceTime call rings through, you're going to see the remote party's video. So in this case, we're using a full screen image. Right, the, how it looks on the left is what it would look like when you're building this in Xcode, which is the uh, default application or the IDE, Integrated Development Environment, uh, for building iPhone apps. Okay, so you're going to drag on a view which fills the whole screen, or whatever you want to do. Maybe you want to make it half the screen. Up to you, but most people will probably use the full view. Um, there's value to like, showing business applications and rendering something on top, but again, you, know, you probably want to adjust the wrapper or you know, build something custom if you want to do that, but most people will look to, to do something like this. Um, if you look at how this works with like somebody that's got a, a landscape or a portrait device, um, it will do its best to display whatever it receives. So you don't actually have to worry about like the layout. Just tell Xcode where you want to display the video, and it will figure out the best way to show it. Self view. Um, Again, in most cases, people will like to include a direct stream of what the remote party will see, maybe in the top right corner. Um, in the wrapper that we provide, uh, you can drag and move it around to wherever you want to, but it's up to you, right? Um, I've seen some people that, that don't want to do that, right? They might just want to have like one-way video, and they might want to have voice going the other way. You could do that, too. Um, but in most cases, people want to have a preview up in the corner of what other people are going to see. Um, so that's included in the wrapper as well. And then the final piece, really, that's applicable to most projects, again, there are some differences. But there's a mute button, a hang-up button, and a rotate camera button. So I want to mute or unmute. I want to hang up the call, or I want to flip the camera around. So obviously I'm using the front-facing camera by default. Uh, again, you could specify different, but, but most people will like to use the front-facing camera first. You can make a very small change to the code, which is going to allow you to, to flip the camera around. There are a number of different events as well that we handle inside of this wrapper, inside of the SDK. Um, nothing too complex in, in this example, right? But there are things that you will want to be notified about as a developer so that you can take action. So if I'm building an application where I'm going to put up a loading screen, so I go and start the call, I want to put up a loading screen, and when I get an event back from the SDK that says the call has begun to ring, Maybe I want to display something like ringing or just connecting or however, right? So I can give some feedback to the user. Um, and all of this is through like callbacks and delegation. And, and basically, it's just like callbacks. Uh, delegation is like a callback, but in, uh, in iOS terminology. Uh, but it's very similar throughout uh, a number of the different platforms that we support. Um, things like call connected, when the call ends, muting and unmuting. Uh, how do I rotate the camera? You know, if you rotate the camera, you might want to do something crazy like tell the third party that you've rotated it. Uh, you could do that all by intercepting the events. Uh, and obviously, like if you want to make the loudspeaker on the device active, um, you've, you've got that on your mobile phone, right? When you're on a regular voice call, 
and there's that speaker button. It's just replicating that functionality, uh, but you can be notified when, when a third party's done that or when you've done it locally. Um, so all of that, but to be honest, as a developer, if you just want to display video, you don't need to worry about that. All of that gets wrapped up in the, in the wrapper that we've provided. Uh, so before we actually dive into building this for real, um, just a, a couple of examples here, just so you, if you do want to dive into the call examples a little bit, it's not actually that complicated. Um, so this is like the call did begin ringing piece of code. So you're going to get a call back when you've placed the call, and when it starts ringing on the remote endpoint, you're going to get a callback, and whatever code that you fill in is going to run. So I've displayed a loading screen. I've received the notification that the call has begun ringing. I just want to update the loading screen saying, call to abc at xyz.com is ringing. Okay. You may want to completely ignore it. It doesn't matter. Um, but the whole point of this is actually it doesn't look very complicated, and it's not, <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the thing. Um, when you mute and unmute the call, you're going to tie that to a function. In this specific example, you can see here where it says self.currentcall.toggle sending audio. If you think about like how the sending of audio works, right? You're either sending or you're not sending. So you're just going to toggle it. So if I'm muted, I'm going to toggle the, the value, and it's going to unmute me. Okay? Very, very simple. Um, in this example, you know how, like on FaceTime, where you hit the mute button and it turns, uh, turns red, from gray to red? All they're doing is just updating the image. Uh, it's probably like four or five lines of code, right? So when I do that, reverse the image to look the opposite of what it was before, right? Just checking to see whether it was sending audio and then updating it. Um, and the final one I wanted to talk about before we go and dive in and actually build something um, is like the, the hang up process. So it, again, it's down to interpretation, uh, but you might want to, when someone presses the hang up button, you may want to make the screen go black so it looks like the call has actually ended. Um, there can be a very slight delay in how long it takes from you pressing the hang up button to something actually working. So again, it's like a, an affordance thing, right? You're showing the user that something has actually happened. Um, in this case, we're just making a call to uh, hang up the call, and then based on whether that was successful or not, removing the view. And all of this is, this is code I've pulled directly from the wrapper that we've provided. So if you want to take the wrapper and customize it, it's a really good starting point. All right, so uh, let's have a go at building something. Let's, uh, let me just minimize the screen here. Okay. Continue. Okay. So I am going to mirror my screen up here. Let me get rid of this here. So um, this is a, a demo application that we've built for this session directly. Uh, there we go. Uh, it's a, an application that we're going to call Doctor Anywhere. Oh, I think I just hit something with my knee, and it's made the uh, <laughs> my bad. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, this is an example that we put together specifically for this session. Um, and the idea here is that we're going to have an app which is going to give you, as a, an end user or consumer of the Doctor Anywhere service, the ability to make a call to a doctor or a medical professional directly from your iPhone. Right? Uh, so I'm going to sign in. Just some uh, hello at abc.com. Sign in with some random password. Okay. And this is the app that we've prepared so far. So a very simple application that we've mocked up. Uh, a number of different medical professionals that are available. The ones that are available are in green. The ones that aren't available are in red. Um, and the idea here is that we want to add voice and video capabilities to this app. Currently, this app knows nothing about Spark. It knows nothing about voice and video. Um, and what we're going to do over the next 10 minutes is show you actually what the process is to integrate that. Um, the idea here is that I will click on something, and that when I press that Start button, it's going to kick off a video call. Today, it won't. Like Right now, it won't. Uh, if I hit Start, it's not going to do anything. Okay. So if I hit that there for a second, let me cancel that and move back. OK. All right. So let me know if this looks all right on the screen for you. Uh, did you see that from the back? It was good. A little bit bigger? OK. That's fine. There we go. All right. Is that better? Good. 
OK, uh, so you don't need to understand what most of the code that's going on here is. It's just the source code for the application that I showed you. Um, and the important bit that I want to show you is, do you remember this view here? This Start button? Yeah? There is a callback that is triggered when I press that Start button. That's what I've built into the app so far. Uh, so if we find that, you can see this line of code here right, is encapsulated by this callback. So that Start button, when that is pressed, I want to execute some code which is in here. So what we need to do is basically fill this function in with the Spark Video SDK so that when you press Start, it's going to kick off a video call to whoever the doctor is. Okay? Um, and the way that we're going to do that, uh, let me just bring up this, the command line here and make this a bit bigger. Uh, so has anybody ever used CocoaPods before or heard of CocoaPods? Not very many. NPM? OK, a couple. Um, Ruby Gems? OK, those types of dependency managers. Um, so think of this as like it's a basically a manager for third-party libraries that you can very quickly add dependencies to your project, and it's going to manage them for you. It's going to take care of versioning, all of these different things. So I can basically tell CocoaPods, the service, that I want to use the Spark SDK, and it's going to figure out the files that I need, and it's going to build those into the app for me. Um, and the way that this works is there is a, I'm going to open up the text file here. There's basically a file that sits in the root of the project, and you specify the different third-party libraries that you want to use. So I used a library here called IL Login Kit to do the login screen. Uh, I had an alert view controller that I used. Um, and I've also included the Spark SDK, so the Spark Video SDK as a, as a component. Um, it's not been implemented in any way into this project. The reason I've just pre-compiled it here is I didn't know how long it was going to take to build the project on, on the stage. So uh, I've pre-run that, but actually the project itself knows nothing about how to use Spark. Okay. Um, so that's all I've done so far is I've added a line into my pod file that says Spark SDK. I then I'm going to go to GitHub and basically just download the wrapper file. So this is the wrapper that I've built myself, and you're free to use and update. And if you don't want to use it, you can just use our raw SDK, but it's up to you. Um, I'm going to download that. You can see it's uh, downloaded into a folder here. OK. I am going to open Xcode back up again, and I'm just going to drag and drop the files that are included with that wrapper into the directory. So I'm going to say new group. I'm just going to call that. Spark SDK wrapper. Okay. Then I'm going to drag and drop these files in. Okay. Okay, there we go. So we've just included those wrapper files. Um, again, all the wrapper is is I've provided a user interface and I've provided some code which is going to handle all of the boilerplate stuff for you. So it's just going to give you a, a drop-in component for voice and video. So uh, I now need to figure out a way to make this function start a video call. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to go back to the top of my file. And I'm going to import the Spark SDK into the project. So I'm going to tell the project, hey, you need to use Spark. So import, and then Spark SDK. Okay? So I've just included that. Um, there's one thing I need to include here, so uh, the callbacks. So there are some events that the wrapper provides, like, uh, hey, you couldn't start a call because you couldn't authenticate, or hey, the call is finished and you want to display something else. Um, in order to do that, I just need to include a, a delegate function at the top. That's it. Just tell it that I want it to inherit from that uh, protocol. Then I want to scroll down, and I'm going to include those three lines that we showed earlier. So I'm going to go back to GitHub. Again, I'm going to show you exactly how I would do it if I was doing it for real. I would go back, and I would grab those three lines. So these are the three lines here. OK. I'm going to paste that in here so that this gets called when we press the Start Call button. I need to fill in a couple of pieces of information. Uh, so I showed you the, the API key earlier, right? Um, I have a text expander. X test API key. There you go. And it's going to magically fill in the API key for me. Uh, it was just a test account that I, that I created. And then we need to tell the SDK who we're going to call. 
Um, there is actually a function inside of this demo project I built that will do it dynamically because every doctor has their own address. But for this purpose, I'm just going to make a, a call to a static address. Uh, I'm going to call one of the guys at the back. I'm going to call the project manager for this project. Uh, is it 1F or 2, Olivier? 1F or 2? Just 1F? Two Fs and one T. OK. There we go. So I'm going to put Olivier's Spark account in, right? So oprofit at cisco.com, O-P-R-O-F-F-I-T. OK. And then the self.present thing will figure out where to display the view for us. Uh, one additional thing is there's a little bit of handling code. Um, and you can see that I actually pasted this in here. So if the call completes and if the call was to fail, we would get notified of that inside of our code. Now. Um, when you start a new app on your iPhone and it wants to use the voice and video privileges, so you want to use the microphone, you want to use the camera, you usually need to provide some type of like, uh, feedback to the user as to why you're requesting those permissions. And the same is true here. right? For anybody that's going to be building anything with video or voice on iOS, you need to be able to tell the user why you're requesting those permissions. Um, and the way that we do that, there is a little file included in every project. And this is going to be a bit small, but just believe me that I'm doing it. Um, it just contains a, a couple of pieces of identification and, and, and different capabilities that you're requesting. So I'm going to add two lines into this file, and I'm going to tell the user why I want to use their video and why I want to use their voice. Okay? If you don't do this, the app will crash, and it will say in the bottom, you did not request the permissions correctly. Okay? Uh, so I'm just going to add two things really quick. Uh, one is uh, privacy, privacy camera usage description. So why do I want to use the camera? Camera, please. I'll put there, and privacy microphone usage description. Microphone, please. OK. So I've just told the, the, the project here, the iPhone project, that I want to use those two permissions. And then when I come to use voice and video, it should present that to me. All right, so I think that, let me just check everything here. I think that should be good to go now. We should be good to make a call. Uh, assuming I've put everything in the right place. Uh, but let's try that. So let me fire up this uh, device here. Cancel that off. Just hit this to build. This might take a second to, uh, to compile. But while that's doing that, I'll show you uh, what this wrapper is. So like the, the reference implementation, it looks a bit like this. right? So when, when we come to demo this in a minute, it's got like a call timer. So how long have I been on the call for? It's got a mute button. It's got a hang up button. And it's got a button to rotate the camera. If you want to change those, you can do it directly from the GUI. Um, really nice, actually. OK, so we have our iPhone app that's loaded. So our Doctor Anywhere is back up again. Uh, let's give this a go. abcxyz.com. Password is whatever. OK, so let's try this now. Uh, so let's say I want to talk to the cardiologist, Dr. Matthew Franklin. Now, if everything's working, and hopefully it will, uh, we should be connected via video. So let's try this. OK, oh, there we go. You see where we said microphone, please, in the code? Same with video, camera, please. OK. And we, there we go. We've got to have Olivier at the back of the room. You can wave Olivier. He's good. Yeah, OK, there he is. He's waving at the back. <laughs> There he is. So that's a, you can't see. OK, that's really weird. Uh, I can see on my, why is it not showing on the projector? I don't know why. <laughs> that completely killed the moment there, but <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can see it on my device, right? So that's the, the voice and video has been fired up. Um, in fact, I could, I don't know why that's not working. That's a real shame. Uh, but for some reason, it's, it's showing on my device. It's just not showing on the remote output. But that, that's it, right? So that was effectively three lines of code. We included a couple of different things to make it work. Um, but that was it. If you want to go ahead and customize it, you can. Um, just for reference, right? So I, I work with Fortune 500 companies. Um, we did a proof of concept with one of the largest banks over here. We had voice and video integrated into their application for a proof of concept purpose in 44 minutes. Like It's, it's just completely different to what we've done in the past. So. Um, very, very powerful. I'm going to hang up on you now, Olivier. <laughs> there we go. I'm going to hang up on you there. OK. We, uh, we may try that again. I may just plug directly in via HDMI if that would help. But uh, you, saw the, you saw how it worked on my phone, right? Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the actual wrapper itself. 
Um, I think we won't go to the end of the hour. We should be, should be good to, to finish a bit early, but the wrapper that's, that's provided um, just wraps a bunch of that functionality together. Um, think of this as like a reference implementation, so everything that you need to use the video SDK, right? It's actually very simple. If you go to developer.cisco.spark.com, click on the SDKs link. Um, there's there's a, a bunch of guides that will explain how you can do it using the raw SDK. If you want to make it even easier, feel free to download the the link that I put up on GitHub. Um, and it's, just think of this as like a bit of a tutorial code. So, you know, it's going to map the remote media view of where the remote participant's video is going to be displayed, the local media view with the camera, um, all of the hang up buttons, all of that's all wrapped for you. Uh, it's going to take care of the call starting process, what happens when you uh, want to start a video call versus a voice call because you might not want to display the full screen video, you just want to display like a black screen or all of that's handled for you. And if you want to tweak it, just grab it, take it. You know, if you want to make it work differently, look differently, um, you can do that. If you want to change the way that buttons look, I don't know, maybe you want to have like two hang up buttons, go into the image and change that to be, I don't know, maybe you want to make like a rotate active button. There you, go. you could have that, right? So you can tweak it and make it look exactly how you wanted to. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Um, so I mean, hopefully that gives you a, a very uh, quick introduction into like how easy embedding video into your apps can be. Um, anybody can do it. Like, actually, a lot of the shows that we do, we get somebody random from the audience to come up and copy the three lines in. It's not a particularly complex thing to do, right? A lot of it's taken care of for you. Um, if you want to have a go at this yourself, you can go to developer.ciscospark.com. Uh, as of today, it's available now uh, for you to start using the voice and video inside of your own apps. Um, initially, we support Swift, so iPhone and iPad apps are going to be written in Swift for the SDK. There is some backwards compatibility and some tweaks that you can, you can do to make it work with Objective-C. That's no issue at all. It, that works just fine. Uh, on the website, so if you want to embed this into a uh, web app, um, we, we've uh, pr basically provided a, a library that's written in JavaScript, uh, and it uses the WebRTC standard. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with WebRTC, it basically enables pluginless video. You know, when you go to a website and you like think back in the day when you had like Flash, and you went to a website and it's like you need to install Flash to be able to watch some content. It's the same thing, right? A lot of the time, if you use some type of inbuilt video. Uh, voice and video calling that's embedded into a page, you need to download a plugin in order to be able to do that. With WebRTC, you don't. So you go to the website and it's just going to work. Um, that basically means that today it works in Firefox and in some versions of Chrome. Um, the other browsers, as they add support for that, Internet Explorer Edge, for example, uh, not Internet Explorer Edge, just Microsoft Edge, uh, in the pre release branch has also got support for WebRTC. So uh, really that functionality gap is filling in quite quickly now. Um, the biggest one, really, that we hope will, will speed up is, uh, is Safari. There's no real WebRTC support in Safari at all. Um, when there is, like, it would enable so many awesome use cases. If you think about, you know, you're having a, some type of consultation about a mortgage with your bank, they could text you a unique link, and if you had WebRTC support inside of mobile Safari, you hit that and you're directly into a video call without having to install anything. Right? That's a really cool experience. So we hope that that Apple will, uh, will add that functionality in the future. So yeah, if you're going to be building on iPhone or iPad, um, you can go ahead and use the Swift version. If you're going to be building for the web, you can use the, the JavaScript WebRTC version. Uh, Android support is going to be coming as well. Uh, it's just that we don't have that available yet. So those are the two that we're taking for launch. Um, that's the exact page link. Uh, I'll share the slides afterwards. But if, and if you just go to like developer.ciscospark.com anyway, then it will come up just fine, and you can, uh, you can use that. Um, so that's really all that I had to talk about today. I think it was uh, some probably interesting stuff for those of you that haven't seen how the voice and video piece fits together. Um, I hope it was interesting. We have a session, I think, in 15 minutes uh, through in the, in the workshop area, uh, where if you want to come down and actually build this out yourself, if you have a Mac, uh, then, then we can make that work. Uh, we may have to download a few things, but uh, please feel free to come along to that uh, if you're interested, and we'll go a little bit deeper into implementation. There's no reason why anybody wouldn't be able to do it. It's all very straightforward, right? We'll just replicate what I did here. So um, yeah, I mean, I hope that was interesting. Uh, we have a little bit of time left now. So if you want to ask a couple of questions, you're more than welcome to. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for, uh, for joining. And I hope that was interesting. <laughs>